Mr. McCoy back with part 11 of Iceberg. As you recall, Hazel had sneaked into the Mollison's room and she had made a startling discovery. So the Mollison's had found a way to pay their debts before leaving England and they would do it by stealing from Sylvia's family. I stuffed the papers back into the notebook, hoping they were in the same order as before, though that couldn't possibly be the case. I replaced the notebook where I'd found it, then lowered the mattress. With the seconds ticking by far too quickly, I began looking around the room for any possible place where they could have hidden my bag. Except, there really was no other place to look, and I was becoming frustrated, and the frustration quickly turned to fear. I was in the very center of the room when I heard a key being fitted into the door to the cabin. At first, I turned to the wardrobe, but I couldn't hide there. The chances were far too great that one of the Mollisons was returning to change their clothes for supper. In one desperate dive, I slid under the bed just as the door opened. The bed skirt gave me cover, but I could barely move because of baggage stored under here. I worried that even breathing would give me away. The door was already unlocked, Mr. Mollison said. You must be more careful, my dear. You were the last one in our room she replied. The fault is yours. Perhaps if you hadn't been so eager to get to the game tables, perhaps if you weren't so eager to spend my hard-earned winnings at the beauty salon, he retorted. Mrs. Mollison's mood immediately changed. There are winnings, she asked. You won a game? I won a very big game, nearly 20 pounds. Once again, the mood shifted. Only 20 pounds? The disappointment in Mrs. Mollison's tone was clear. That wouldn't cover even one of our tickets. As they spoke, my eyes drifted to a paper lying halfway beneath the bed skirt. It had to be one of the papers I'd dropped. If they looked down, they'd see it. Then they'd see me. Meanwhile, Mr. Mollison continued, It's more money than you've earned today. What about the plan? Mrs. Mollison, whomp, then sat on the bed above me. I made progress. The papers we want are in a safe deposit box. Now all we need is the key. Papers. I had thought Sylvia's safe deposit box contained only money. Were there some important papers inside, too? Mrs. Mollison shifted one foot, nearly touching the paper that had fallen beneath her bed. I feared she'd step on it, then hear the paper crackle. As carefully as I possibly could, I put my hand on it and began slowly pulling it beneath the bed with me. Once I had it closer, I realized that I had seen this paper before. It was the same rose-colored paper as the Mollisons had with them when I first saw them on deck. This time it was unfolded, though I couldn't and wouldn't be able to see all of the writing at this angle. At the top, I read, Step 1. Repay debt. Step 2. Book tickets on the Californian, but that was crossed off, Titanic. Step 3. Get the safe deposit key. Step 4. That was as far as I could read without moving the paper again, but this was obviously the outline of the Mollison's plan. I wished it had more details, but I hoped there was enough here that I could report them for any crimes. What about that Hazel Rothberry? Mrs. Mollison asked. That got my attention. I forgot about the letter and listened more intently. She definitely complicates this plan, which makes it far more dangerous for us, Mr. Mollison said. I will have to get everything we want with a game of cards. There's too much risk of you losing. <laughs> Not if I cheat, he chuckled. Set up the game tonight in the main dining room. I will impress the entire ship with my skills. Mrs. Mollison sighed. <sighs> Very well, dear. I'll see what I can do. But is gambling really a skill? They continued to bicker until they had left the cabin. I waited a full minute with my mind like a sponge, absorbing every thought and worry and fact around me, and there was plenty of it to be absorbed. Then I slid out from under the bed to leave as fast as I could. My notebook was still missing, but I didn't dare to remain here a second longer. The danger was far too great that one of them might return, and besides, I needed to tell Sylvia what I had overheard. I knocked on the door directly across from the Mollison's room, then whispered, Sylvia, it's me. The door opened, and there was Miss Gruber staring down at me with a stern frown. She said, I thought you would come here sooner or later. I stared back at Miss Gruber with no idea what I should say now. All that squeaked out of me was, may I see Sylvia, please? Certainly not. You are a bad influence on my ward. I could hardly disagree with her, but I was trying to help Sylvia now. I said, Miss Gruber, it's about the Mollisons. I just heard, 
I stopped there and clamped my mouth shut. If I told Miss Gruber what I'd heard, she would know that I'd been in the room and I absolutely could not let anyone find out about that. But they would eventually figure out that someone had disturbed the papers in the notebook that I'd found and one of them was now beneath their bed. Once they discovered that paper, they would know someone had been in their room. And without a doubt, they would know it had been me. I would have to warn Sylvia another time. So I turned on one heel and ran. Once again, I'd failed to prove myself as her friend. Once again, the Mollisons had won. On my way below decks, I spotted Charlie with the paper in one hand. He beckoned to me, so I hurried over to him. I think I've crossed the ship 20 times already today to pass messages from one person to another, he said, then glanced sideways at me. No more notebook? Have you given up the exciting world of journalism? My smile was seeing him quickly fell. I'm sorry for what happened yesterday with Mrs. Mollison. He lifted a finger more serious than I'd expected. Once again, I'd like to tell you that it is no trouble at all. But in fact, that turned out to be quite a bit of trouble, didn't it? Now he found his smile. And it was worth every minute. She's a terrible person, Hazel. I'm happy you got away from her. I didn't get away enough. She stole my bag with all my money in it and my pen and notebook. Charlie let out a low whistle. <whistles> you don't say. I knew the Mollisons were low-life swindlers, but I didn't have them pegged as shoulder bag thieves. Do you think they wanted your money or your notebook? It must be the notebook. I overheard them talking about needing to stop me. Maybe they think I will write about them? <laughs> Why would they think that? I blinked at, back at Charlie. I do plan to write about them. Sylvia is going to help me. I see. Charlie shifted his weight, which was probably the alternative to rolling his eyes at me. So maybe you shouldn't write about them and they'll leave you alone. What kind of a journalist would? You're not a real journalist, Hazel. Charlie pushed a hand through his hair. Maybe you will be one day. I hope you will be because I think you'd be brilliant at it. But for now, leave this to the adults. You should warn Miss Gruber, then let it go. I was still stinging from what he'd said, so my tone was sharp as I replied, Miss Gruber would never believe me. She dislikes me too much. Charlie shrugged. I think Miss Gruber dislikes everything and everyone. I think sometimes hard things happen to people, and a few of them forget how to smile. That gave me pause. You think that's the reason she wears black and always frowns? Maybe. A long silence followed before Charlie said, Listen, when I said you weren't a real journalist, that doesn't mean you can't write your story. In fact, I just heard something I reckon you'll want to know. The trouble down in the boiler room is over. I leaned toward him. You mean the fire? Shh, yes, it's out. Is there any damage? From what I'm told, it's still too hot for the firemen to get close to it. I reckon we'll know more in the morning, but that is a spot of good news, eh? It was a lot of good news, especially compared with how the rest of my day had been. Hazel! Charlie and I both turned. There was Sylvia hurrying toward us, nearly breathless. I'm so glad I found you, she said. I wanted to apologize for not warning you about the... She paused, her eyes on Charlie. Hello again. I haven't seen you since you had me invite Hazel to dinner, he said cheerfully. Have you enjoyed your trip so far? Uh, nearly every minute, Sylvia said, and I have seen you on the deck. They keep you moving, don't they? I can always go a bit faster, he said. It's what I'm paid to do, and I'm happy to do it. You can trust Charlie, I said, and you don't need to apologize for anything. I know you would have warned me if you could. Charlie grimaced. This sounds like one of those conversations a crewman of the ship shouldn't hear. If you'll excuse me as I go to deliver this note, I'll try to find you again soon. He ran off in one direction while Sylvia and I simply leaned against the ship's rails, staring out at the ocean. I wanted to begin first to say everything that I needed to before Sylvia shifted the conversation in another direction. I shouldn't have lied to you about why I was going to America, but I didn't want you to think of me as some common factory worker. Sylvia smiled. If I were to think that of you and that way, then I would think of someone who is working hard to help her family and someone who is taking charge of her life to get ahead. I saw her smile and she seemed to believe what she was saying, but she made the factory work sound far more noble than it would be. 
Mum had warned me that I might be working as long as 10 hours a day, often in some of the most dangerous areas of the factory. Whatever Sylvia pictured for how my life would be in America, it wouldn't be nearly that nice. Sylvia continued, Does your mother want you to work in the factories? No, but I need to find work somewhere, at least until my brothers are old enough to build up our farm or find work themselves. Sylvia thought for a moment, then said, After we return to New York, there is a good chance my father will dismiss Miss Gruber as our governess. Oh? We went to England to visit my grandparents. My grandfather gave Miss Gruber 500 pounds to bring back home to my father. That's what is in our safe deposit box now. But Miss Gruber has been acting very strangely ever since, changing our travel plans at the last minute, leaving me with lessons to complete while she disappears for hours and gives no explanation. She's still acting rather odd. Is it possible she is helping the Mollisons to steal your family's money? Sylvia's eyes widened with shock, and I immediately regretted making the accusation. Why would she help them? Sylvia firmly shook her head. They only met because our cabins are so close. Miss Gruber wouldn't turn on my family for them. No, of course not. There is something unusual in her behavior, though, Sylvia said. I will find out about what it is. Until then, do you remember when I told you that there is a way you wouldn't have to work in the factories? So I could write the story about the Mollisons? I don't think I can. Actually, I have a better idea. What if you worked for my family instead? What do you think Hazel's reaction will be to this suggestion? Share with your fellow listener. My nose wrinkled. As a servant? No, as my companion. You'd assist me with my hair and wardrobe, and if I'm at dinner or a dance, you would be there to help, should any problems arise. That sounds like a servant. It's different. You would be treated almost as a member of the household, and you would be paid as well. Sylvia stared directly at me. Much better pay than you would ever earn in the factories, and much safer. My eyes widened. I scarcely dared to ask the next question for fear I had misunderstood. Why would you want me to be your companion? Sylvia smiled. Because we're friends, Hazel, and this is only if you're interested. Of course I was. It sounded a thousand times better than working in a garment factory, but still not as good as becoming a journalist. And I'd never get there if I accepted Sylvia's offer. I said, may I think about my answer? Of course, but I do hope you will say yes. Until then, I need to tell you what I saw when I sneaked in. Sneaked in where? Miss Gruber asked as she walked up behind us. My heart sank and I slowly turned to face her. Miss Gruber was folding her arms with her mouth pinched in disapproval. Sylvia said, I offered Hazel a position as my companion. You will withdraw your offer at once, Miss Gruber eyed me. Hazel is a liar and a thief. She let herself into the Mollison's room and from what I am told, stole a highly valuable paper from them. I shook my head. I didn't steal anything, I swear it. But you don't deny breaking into their room. I didn't break in. The door was left partially open. That detail was hardly the point of her complaint, but I needed every bit of help I could get. It's still a crime, Hazel. And when Mrs. Mollison reported her suspicions to me just now, she added one other detail. Is it true that you are a stowaway aboard the ship? I looked down, tears filling my eyes. Miss Gruber turned her attention towards Sylvia. I told you it was a mistake to befriend this girl. She has come from nothing and her life will amount to nothing. I'm going to become a journalist, I said between gritted teeth. A girl who comes from poverty should know better than to have such a big dream. When word of your crime spreads, you will never work as a journalist. You will never be hired to work anywhere. When word spreads, Sylvia asked, Miss Gruber, did you tell anyone? As an honest woman, I had to report the crime. Miss Gruber gestured to a ship's officer coming toward us, someone I had seen before. This was Officer Kent, the man who had warned me away from the first class promenade when we first set sail from England. I was running out of time, but I had to speak quickly. I turned to Sylvia and whispered, you need to find out how much money is in your safe deposit box. If I'm correct, then you will be missing 420 pounds of it. Speak up, child, Miss Gruber said. What did you say? 
I stared back at her with as much defiance as I could muster. The Titanic has many secrets, Miss Gruber, and so do I. That was as far as I got before Officer Kent reached us. He looked down at me as if I were a thorn he had plucked from his foot. Hazel Rothbury, he asked, you will come with me. I will, I said, but first let me explain to Sylvia. She is Miss Thorngood to you, Miss Gruber said. Officer Kent took my arm, but I pulled it away. One more minute, please. Please, sir, I said. This way, Miss Rothbury. Officer Kent gently took my arm again. As he led me away, I looked back at Miss Gruber. Didn't you ever have a dream so big that you were willing to risk everything for it? If you never have, I feel sorry for you. Miss Gruber seemed to flinch. Officer Kent continued to lead me away. He said, this is one risk you should not have taken, even for a very big dream. Stowing away aboard a ship is a very serious matter, young lady. By then, we had moved out of sight of Sylvia and Miss Gruber. I hung my head and followed Officer Kent toward whatever punishment awaited me. Whatever it would be, the stocks or a dungeon or sending me back home to my family in shame, I doubted anything could make me more terrified than I was at this very moment. Which would be worse, going to jail on board ship or facing your family in shame? Share with your fellow listener. There was no getting around it. I was in serious trouble. A stiff punishment was surely headed my way, but no matter what it was, even worse would be the consequences for my family if I was unable to find work. I needed to think of a plan to help them, but as I trudged behind Officer Kent toward the boat deck, all I could think about was that I had dozens of unanswered questions, and a ship's officer was certain to have all the answers. I had to ask. I had to try. Sir, in this area of the ocean, could there be dark icebergs or even blue icebergs? Officer Kent gestured toward the ocean. I, I, I see no icebergs uh, anywhere. Do you? I looked, but saw only an endless stretch of water. No, but could there be? I suppose. That was two questions successfully answered. Why not a third question, then? Do the lookouts in the crow's nest always have binoculars, or is that only on nights with bad weather? I don't know anything about the binoculars. I'm not a deck officer. My heart skipped a beat as we passed near Captain Smith walking along the promenade with another officer, his arm pointing out to sea as if giving orders. I turned back to Officer Kent. Would you mind if I asked the captain about that? I would mind very much, and so would he. You do remember why you are up here, correct? Yes, sir, but I can explain. Officer Kent barely slowed his step. For your sake, young lady, I hope it is a good explanation. From the boat deck, he walked me up a short flight of stairs to the bridge. He gestured for me to follow him, but I didn't move. How could I care about my punishment when I was here, in the command center of the greatest ship on Earth? Slowly, I turned in a full circle, watching senior officers in close conversation, occasionally giving commands, and with a snappy, yes sir, the sailors immediately obeyed. What an extraordinary gift that I should be able to see all of this. Of course, I was only here because I was in serious trouble, but at least I was here. Questions flooded my mind so fast, I hardly knew where to begin. As it turned out, the questions would have to stay in my head for a while longer. You'll wait in here, Miss Rothbury. Officer Kent opened a door marked as an officer's lounge, leading me to a room with a fine wood paneling and comfortable chairs and desks for writing. It seemed to be a place where the ship's officers could relax or hold private conversations, or apparently where they could punish a girl who had stowed aboard their ship. On one of the desks was a chart with notepads and handwritten messages marked with a code, many of them prefaced with the letters MSY. I pointed to it. What do those letters mean? That's the call sign for the Titanic, the letters that identify us, Officer Kent said. Now, Miss Gruber has accused you of... Why those letters? I asked. They have nothing to do with the name of the ship. And you should have nothing to do with this ship, he said. Is the accusation true? Are you a stowaway? I drew in a deep breath. So how do you suppose Hazel is going to get herself out of this fix, if she's able to? Share your prediction with your fellow listener. And now, moments more of part 11 of Iceberg. 
Uh, yes and no, he arched a brow. Oh? A stowaway is someone who sneaks onto a ship with no intention of buying a ticket. I do plan to pay for my ticket, sir. I just don't have the money yet. Officer Kent frowned. It doesn't matter what you plan to do. My tone became more urgent. How can it not matter, sir? Sir, I already promised to pay for the ticket as soon as I have the money. To whom did you make this promise? Officer Kent asked. It was... I stopped there. We'll find out what happens next to Hazel and the Titanic as Iceberg continues.